Then this morning I, I titled my message, I really wrote the title at the last minute, He Sent a Boat to Save You. And I really titled it this morning, it was kind of like an afterthought. But um, the scripture, the first scripture we're going to turn to is Genesis chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. Now I have to tell you that a lot of these messages that I've been preaching, I'm kind of thinking that maybe they, they're definitely for me, but I believe that this is... Uh, Information that really all of us, to some extent, are going through because we're all part of the body of Christ. So it's relatively somewhat generic for the body of Christ, but I know that they speak to me. It says in Genesis chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, The Lord said unto Noah, Come thou in all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. So in other words, here's Noah, and God's scanning the horizon. He's looking for righteousness. There's a lot we could go really deep with this, but we're going to kind of keep it relatively surface level on this situation right here. God saw the wickedness that was in the earth, and God saw Noah as someone righteous. That means that Noah was different than the world around him because he was living for the Lord, whereas the rest of the world was kind of just not kind of definitely going their own way. Going their own way and following the instruction of the enemy instead of the instruction of God. So when God saw Noah, he saw him as a man of righteousness. And so he said that, he said, now I want you to, I want you to come with me uh, and all your house into the ark. Now one of the first things that I want to point out to you there also is that it certainly sounds like God was already in the ark. God's saying, come into the ark where I am. In other words, God was going to be with Noah when he brought him in there. And he says, of every clean beast, you shall take thee by sevens. Now, that's, now I want to stop there again. So if you look at how he brought in the unclean beasts, they brought them in two by twos, pairs of for mating and reproduction. But of the clean beasts, they brought in seven, three pairs, but one extra. I've taught this before. The reason why is because the first thing that Noah did when he got off the boat was he built an altar and he offered sacrifice unto the Lord. Types, again, of the cross, types of redemption, types of the purchasing or the payment of sin, way back even before the flood, that God was painting a picture for humanity of Jesus that would come. And he says, you shall take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of the beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Of fowls also the, the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of the earth. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. So a lot of sevens going on here. Seven clean animals, seven of the fowl, because many of the types of birds were also used as sacrifices, turtle pigeons, turtle doves, and certain types of fowl. But then not only that, seven days. You're going to get in the ark seven days. So once you're given, given your time, you're going to get in the ark. All these animals are getting in the ark. Seven day period of of rest, if you will, before the 40 days of judgment starts, right? That's what happened. He says, then I'm going to cause it to rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. As I already said, seven clean animals, seven days, making sure that the righteous and all that would be saved were saved before the judgment started. God has a plan of salvation to save the righteous before judgment started. The Apostle Paul says we were not appointed unto wrath. There's coming a day when the wrath of God, just as it was in the antediluvian world, anti means before, you got to ante up before you get in the game, anti before diluvian flood, before the flood. Before the flood, God brought, he, because of, at the flood, God brought judgment on the unbelieving world. But he saved that which was righteous. Amen. And so he brought forth judgment on this world. And he brought forth judgment and saved the righteous, that which would believe in the truth. And he judged the world that Satan was inspiring to go his way. There's a whole lot of information that we could talk about pre-flood. We're not getting into that this morning. But let us say there was a world full of occultism. It was a world full of wickedness. It was a world full of people living their lives for their flesh in any old way that they chose to do. Uh, and God destroyed the plans of Satan that he had inflicted upon 
the world. He had destroyed the lies of Satan, at least to that point, that Satan had brought upon the world. You know, it doesn't really matter how good something feels, how good, how much it feels right. If it's not of the Lord's will, then it's not of God, and therefore it's not of, then that means it's of sin. That's right. Right? The result of wickedness of the world was that God saved Noah from the world. He saved Noah from the judgment that came upon the world. He saved Noah from the wrath that he prepared for Satan's plans. God destroyed Satan's plans at that time, and he brought his people through to the other side. Interestingly, God called Noah into the ark, and I've already made the point where he was already located. And there was a seven-day period where he saved all that he wanted to save before the reign of the judgment began. But then, 40 days. 40 days of rain upon the earth, a time frame where the earth opened up, the sky opened up, and both poured forth water and brought judgment upon the known world of that day. Not on the second day, when he separated the, the, the sky from the waters that were in the sky. Not on the third day, when he separated the earth from the waters of, that were on the sky on the seventh day. God al allowed the judgment to take place on the seventh day. The seventh day which we talked about even last week, I believe, when he rested. The day of Sabbath that he gave and he instituted the Sabbath rest, which we know now typologically represents our salvation in Christ and the fact that in him we have received rest spiritually. See, there's a big problem in the modern church world today. And listen to me. If you've been to other churches that preach differently the gospel I'm sorry they're not preaching the gospel but the point is is uh, listen if you've been everybody raise your hand if you've been to other churches you've experienced other churches all right I'm not picking on other churches because I don't even know the church you went to okay I'm just trying to make a point I've been to other churches too several other churches one of the things that I've noticed a big way that you can separate them out is that many people preach a doctrine of works towards righteousness. In other words, you either going to find yourself righteous because you have a positive confession. That's the word of faith. And if you want the prosperity that God's going to bring, you got to say the right thing with the lips of, and the tongue of your mouth enough times. See, you're working it now. You're confessing the right thing of God. Now God's pleased with you because of your confession. So he's going to bless you. That's what they teach. Then some people teach that if you want to be right in the eyes of God, that you got stuff you got to do. You go to church so many times a week. You read your Bible so often. You go, you get involved in ministry. I know y'all have heard me say this before, but the problem is, is that you need to keep hearing it because it's inherent in human nature. And the reason that I know that is because right after the fall, that, that Adam and Eve immediately trying to cover their own sin to make themselves righteous before God sowed fig leaves together in the work of their own hands and tried to, pre to, to prevent their exposure before God. But God's response was, that's not going to work, and he provided skins for them. The first sacrifice, the first sacrificial offering, God's showing us, no, it requires shedding of blood. He said that in the book of Leviticus. I've given you blood to make atonement for your soul, for the life of the creature is in the blood. He said, the day that you eat thereof, you're going to die. You're going to die. And what happened was, was that they died spiritually, which ultimately resulted in physical death. Therefore, it required death to pay the penalty for sin. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what the gospel says. But it couldn't just be any death. You can't die for your sin. I told y'all that story before when I was witnessing to that Muslim woman. I told her, I said, one of us is wrong. I said, you know that, and I know that, right? I mean, we can get some knuckles on that, right? I mean, because we ain't both right. She's like, yeah, you're right. I said, that's right. We're not both right. And I said, the problem with, I said, let me quote to you what Muhammad said in the Hadith, because I had learned this little one little punchline. Well, it was good. I wrote a whole paper on it. With one drop of the martyr's blood, all his sin are atoned. Muhammad was teaching that if the Muslim radicalist dies, his sins are atoned, and 72 virgins wait for him wherever it is that they go paradise. I said, ma'am, the problem with that is this, is that the martyr's blood is tainted with sin. Your blood's tainted with sin. My blood's tainted with sin. If you or I die for our sin, we just get what we deserved. It required sinless blood to be offered up. 
Jesus was the sinless one who came to make right with the first Adam made wrong. When he died, he paid the penalty for sin. The wages of sin was death, but the, the gift of eternal life is Jesus is, is through Jesus Christ our Lord. So when Adam brought death to the world, Jesus brought life. We're talking about Noah here. We're talking about the Sabbath. We're talking about the Sabbath and the rest and the fact that God is providing salvation for his people, amen, and there was a time frame of salvation, but then a 40 days started. And the only point that I'm trying to make is this. During that 40 days, whenever the rain, the heavens opened up and started to, a deluge of rain came down and the earth broke up and a deluge of water came up and the flood was on the earth. During that 40 days, it's not like Noah was just over there. I mean, he probably was, in a sense, having a party and awfully joyful. But at the same time, you think that he wasn't mourning because of people that he knew that he had been preaching to, that he had tried to get to come along. You don't think that it got a little bit antsy after some period of time being in that boat cooped up. In other words, it was somewhat of a trial. The number 40, and we preached this not that long ago, is connected to testing and, and oftentimes connected to trials. There was a period of trial that was connected. First salvation, but then there's a trial. Noah dealt with 40 days of rain. Israel dealt with 40 years of wilderness. Jesus dealt with 40 days of testing from Satan. And these 40 days, Noah had to go through a trial of sorts, a time when everything that he knew before was behind him, and what was before him, he didn't know what to expect. A testing time where it was him and God. Him and God. Noah had to trust God through this journey of this period of time. I mean, he was in the boat longer than 40 days, but the, but the judgment was for 40 days upon the earth. God said, get in the ark. God was already in there. Come in here where I am located. This is me talking, paraphrasing what I would think God would say to Noah. <laughs> Come in here where I am located and I will be with you as you go through this time until you reach the destination I have planned for you. Whoever told you that once you gave your heart to Jesus, uh, that you gave your heart to the Lord, that no more would there be trial or tribulation. That's another problem with the word of faith doctrine. It's like whenever they look at you in the word of faith. And, don't, and listen, I know enough about this stuff to where I can talk about it. Because I've been, I, I listened to it long enough. They would look down on people if you weren't wearing the nicest suit, driving the nicest car. I know I've told you this before, but I've heard stories where preachers were going to a conference and they would literally park their vehicle that they really drove, go to the rental car place, rent a Cadillac, and then drive up to the conference so that the people like, oh, he's blessed in prosperity and whatever the case. And it's all a facade and it's all a lie. Uh, because the truth be told is that true prosperity is not necessarily something that's always financial or material. Rather, spiritual blessings are eternal and they'll get you through the 40 days a whole lot better than what the financial situation will. A lot of times money can bring problems. Don't get me wrong. I know it's e easy for you to say, preacher, maybe you ain't having money problems. By the grace of God right now, I've got my own maybe little money problems, but sometimes they're small compared to what other people are going through. So I understand that it's easy to talk about it. But at the same time, you hear some people that swear that money didn't do anything good for them. Well, I mean, I use Deion Sanders as an example. I've heard his own personal testimony. And I've shared some of this before with y'all. But listen, he was playing for the Atlanta Braves, one of the greatest athletes probably that ever produced on the world, other than Bo Jackson, but he hurt his hip. Deion Sanders was playing baseball for the Atlanta Falcons starting starting cornerback for the Atlanta, I'm sorry, Atlanta Braves, a starting outfielder. And, and, Dallas. huh? Falcons. What did I say? Braves. Yeah, Atlanta yeah, Braves. Braves and Dallas. Yeah, Bra Braves and Falcons. Yeah, he played for Dallas later, but oh. you're too young to know. He played for the Falcons. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Atlanta Braves for baseball. They went to the World Series. Atlanta Falcons for football, catching a helicopter from one practice to the other practice. And Dion, they called him prime time, Neon Dion. He was all about the show, wearing the chain, gold chains. And I mean, look, he had everything that anybody could ever want. He was as smooth as ice. And one day he found himself in his Rolls Royce, looking, peering over a cliff in California, about to drive that thing off the cliff. And they asked him, why in the world you had everything? He said, because I didn't have nothing. Yeah. Thought I had everything, but I didn't have nothing. And from that, he did. He has been a professing Christian. What the level of his Christianity is, I don't know. That's between him and the Lord. But I will say, thank God he found him some Jesus because he was about to drive his car off the cliff. 
So don't tell me that money's going to bring you everything that you want. That prosperity message is a lie. Yes. That's like the God of mammon is what Jesus called it. Anyway, that's another message for another time. God was in the ark. He said, come in here. I'm going to be with you during this time frame until I bring you to the place where I want you to go. And the point that I was making is whoever told you that once you gave your heart to the Lord that you would never have to go through trials or testing or face unknown circumstances. It wasn't telling you the truth. But one thing is certain. Just as God was with Noah in the ark, he will also be with you in the, in the journey that you take Amen. upon this earth. Amen. Here's a New Testament example. You know, he will, what I wrote in my notes was, he will be with us in Christ. And I want to use as a New Testament example of in Christ out of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Y'all heard me talk about this a lot, but every now and then I feel like we need to come back to it. The prepositional phrase, in Christ, right? In Christ, in whom? In Him? These are all prepositional phrases describing our connection or our relationship with Jesus. In the ark. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to equate this to. Noah was in the ark. The ark was salvation for him from judgment. You and I in Christ is salvation for us from judgment. In Christ, God is going to give us the victory. Amen. And so the Apostle Paul, this is more of a personal example of the Apostle Paul's life. And this is the scripture that I was talking about when we prayed before that I didn't really understand why. But after people gave their testimony and asked for prayer in the beginning, I realized that this was here for a reason. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 17. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to the church in Corinth. He was going through some things. I've shared this passage of Scripture with you before where people were lying about his ministry. Saying that he was preaching false doctrine when in reality they were preaching false doctrine. And coming against him. And that it required of him to have grace from the Lord in order to forgive. And he goes on to say, for to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you or what's really in you. Whether you be obedient in all things to whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. He's talking about these people that were causing trouble. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now, let's just stop for a second. So there's a situation going on in Corinth where Paul is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and false teachers are coming in behind him once he's gone. There's no email back here yeah. in these days. So he's already moved on to the next town on a boat, gone through the Mediterranean Sea, possibly all the way back in Jerusalem by now. And he gets possibly a year later correspondence through a letter that has to come on another ship that there's people causing trouble in Corinth. So he writes a letter. God only knows how long it takes to get there to respond to all of this situation. All right. And what's taking place is that these people are lying on him. But as he's had the time to deal with what it is that he's dealing with, one thing that he does know is this. I'm not ignorant of Satan's devices. You and I need to not be ignorant of Satan's That's devices. Right. There's a whole lot of devices that he has. But in this particular situation, it's directly related to bitterness of heart. Call, listen to me. The enemy will cause people to come against you to do you dirty. Uh, listen to me. Sometimes it's your mama. Sometimes it's your daddy. Sometimes it's your best friend. Sometimes it's your own children. And the enemy will twist stuff up in your mind and do all kinds of things to you to open up a door so that he can step in. He's like, oh, here we go. And he's going to step in and he's going to start to manipulate and cause all kind of confusion in your head. And one of the things that you and I need to remember most of all is this, what they did to our Savior. They blindfolded him. They thrust crown of thorns on his head. They plucked the beard out of his face. They hit him on the head with rods. They put a purple robe on him after they had stripped him naked. And they said, prophesy, son of man, who it is that hits you. And then whenever Jesus is dying for the sins of humanity, he says, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. He showed us forgiveness. 
He showed us what it really means. to. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody's going to try, I mean, I ain't the baddest dude in the room. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm just not. But if you're going to try to blindfold me and spit on me, if there's any way for me to get out of that situation in my own strength, I'm telling you, I'm going to be pretty angry at that point in time is my only point. And, but Jesus shows us that he came to love. He came for reconciliation. He came to set the captive free. But so many times in our own lives, we allow that door to be opened up. And we allow the enemy to come in and to cause a root of bitterness to come in our heart because of whatever's happened. Sometimes the enemy will turn it twisted so bad in our hearts and minds that next thing you know, we're bitter towards God. And God's saying, what are you bitter towards me for? I'm not the one that did it. Listen to me. If somebody in this church hurts you, if the preacher hurts you, I'll apologize in advance. I'm just going to be, but you know, it's one thing that's kind of sad is, is that like, if I hear, oh, somebody's running their mouth about me or somebody's running their, I, it don't even really bother me that bad anymore. You know why? I expect it. I expect people to do stuff that they're not supposed to do. I expect people to go and run their mouth. I expect people to cause trouble behind other people's back because I, that's what people do. Because the Lord knows that I've done it my own self. And so what I do is, is that I guard my heart. I'm like, Lord, I just want to love. It's not, it can't, Matt can't produce that in his own life. That's called a fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. The Holy Spirit has to produce that in Matt's life. But Matt has to want to. But see what the Apostle Paul's doing, he's guarding his heart. He said, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. We know how he works in this area. He's going to cause a conflict. He's going to get back to me. I'm going to hear it. I'm going to be frustrated because they're lying on me. And next thing you know, the enemy's like, uh-huh, now I'm stepping in. I'm going to cause bitterness in your heart. That's up to you how you handle that. But I'm here to tell you it's not the Lord. What I wanted to say is, is that for, for Noah in the ark, God gave him victory. Amen. Because when it was all said and done, he came out on the victorious side of the judgment. And guess what? In this journey that you and I live in, in Christ... The Lord wants to give us victory. And that's what he began to say. He says, and he says, for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel and a door was opened unto me of the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus, my brother. So he was hoping when he got there that he would see Titus. But taking my leave of them, I went from there into Macedonia. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph always, in Christ. Praise God. He's always in Christ. God is always giving us the victory. It may not come the way you wanted it. It may not look the way you expected it. But the victory is in Christ. Amen. Look at this. He goes on to say this. And makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. In other words, every place we go, when we begin to speak forth the knowledge of God, it's like a savor that rises up into the nostrils of God. If you read about the Old Testament sacrifices, the one they all represented Jesus. But there were some that represented Jesus just given his whole life. Like the whole burnt offering with the fat. And those ones that had fat in it. The Lord's portion. Guess what? It rose up and it was a sweet smelling savor in the nostrils of God. Whenever God's word goes forth into the, into the world for people to hear. It's like a sweet smelling savor unto the Lord. But look what he goes on to say. He says, for we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. Because we're revealing Jesus to the world. We're revealing Jesus to the church. We're revealing Jesus to the world. He goes on to say this. He says, and, uh, he says, for we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. So either way, check this out. Either way, when, when the gospel is preached, the sweet savor is going up into the Lord's nostrils. Now, they got two different kind of people on earth. So one of them, he says, it's, it's to those that are saved, but also to those that perish. It doesn't matter the response or who the crowd is. God's getting the sweet savor in his nostrils because we're doing the will of the Lord by preaching the gospel. He says, uh, for we are, uh, he says, to the one we are the savor of death unto death. Oh, here we go again. Talking about Jesus. Talking about, oh, they're so excited about the Lord. And they so, they, they're getting so excited about the things of God. And, you know, they, they just, they, oh, they frustrate me so bad. they like a stench in my nostril. Well, it might be a stench in your nostril, but it's a sweet savor going up into the nostrils of God. And to the other, the savor of life unto life. So the person that's receptive of the Lord is hungry for the things of God. 
That's one of the things that probably irritates me the most when I do street ministry. And I go ahead, I mean, Troy probably knows what I'm talking about, I'm sure. I go on the street, I go to hand somebody a child, and they're like, oh, I'm a Christian. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So that means that you love the Word of God, and that means you'll be happy to read this and support the fact that, I mean, you do think it's a good thing that somebody's out here telling somebody about Jesus, right? Yeah, I said, well, God, take it home and read it when you get a chance, man. Because it's like all of a sudden they feel like, oh, I already know that. And I'm like, well, okay, if you really was hungry for the ways of the Lord, because I can tell you that the time that Aaron and I went to, on Bourbon Street with Lance Rowe carried that cross out there, that was the night I'll never forget. It. All right? A whole lot went down that night. But one of the things that I do remember is that every now and then, boy, there were so many mockers on Lance, people spitting on him, calling him names. He just out there, boy, smiling. Jesus loves you. He died for you. If you don't give your heart to him, you know what I mean? Look, he's just going on, not deterred by nothing. I mean, dude, stuff going on behind his back that I'm like, dude, do you know what this? He's like, yeah, I know they got all them little toys around here. I ain't worried about all that. I'm here to preach Jesus. I mean, people doing lewd stuff. But every now and then, somebody walked past him, and the next thing you know, they'd come back and tears would be filled in their eyes. And they say, dude, I just want to tell you something. I want to thank you for doing what you're doing because I was raised a Christian and I'm backslidden. And I'm just so, dude, this is the right thing. You're doing the right thing. He's like, bow your knee right now, brother, and get your heart right with Jesus. <laughs> and some of them would. Some of them might, like, man, I'm not ready yet, but I just wanted you to know, thank you. And then they'd walk on, you know. And so what I'm trying to say is, is this, is that that's the difference between the person that's out there on the street trying to hand them a train. Like, yeah, I know all that. Well, if you know all that, then I don't think you know much of anything. Because the truth is, is that we should all have an, a teachable spirit. And when we see somebody doing the work of the Lord, it should be a sweet savor unto us. Amen? Anyway, the point that I'm trying to make is, is that the Apostle Paul was going through a personal crisis in his life. And he was focused on really what was important to God, which was bringing forth the truth of the gospel. And he said the triumph comes in Christ. And I don't know if that's a good word for you, but it sure is a good word for me. Because if I'm going to go through things and people are being critical and whatnot. And look, this has been going on since I started preaching. Everybody's got an opinion about something. And people have come against, oh, the message of the cross, man. What about, you know, they cut. Half the time they don't even know what they're talking about. And I know if I say it the wrong way, then I'm going to turn them off. At least I've learned that much through the years. But he goes on to say, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. But as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, we speak, we, God speak we in Christ. He's saying we're not over here trying to twist the scriptures. We're just doing what God's called us to do, to speak forth the knowledge of God. And it's a sweet savor in his nostrils. So once again, this situation was more personal for Paul. But the point I wanted to make is in Christ. In Christ, there's triumph. In Christ, there's victory. In the ark, God saved Noah from the judgment but there was still some trial that he had to go through. In Paul's life, he was saved from the ultimate judgment and wrath of God. But yet at the same time, there were still trials that he had to go through. You and I in our personal lives are going to go through things like this. We just are. People are going to come against us. And we can either let the Lord do it as a work in our hearts. And sometimes it's because it, sometimes God's allowing stuff because of us. That's right. Okay. That's one thing I've learned, buddy. Let me tell you something. When you're going through something, one of the first things you ought to do is stop and look in the mirror and say, okay, Lord, all this stuff's going on. But is there something going on in me? Because don't you think that your little heart is as pure as what we want to think Amen. it is? Point being is that we're still in this unglorified body. It's corruptible flesh. And many times we think that the motives of our heart are pure. And the Apostle Paul said, hey, my conscience isn't telling me anything about myself, but that doesn't make me right. Now, the Apostle Paul said that. Hello, time out. Stop for a second. The Apostle Paul said, my conscience is not revealing anything to me that is, that's going on in my life, but that does not justify me. Just because my conscience is clear doesn't justify me. Yeah. Lord said, you better, you better examine your own self and make sure that you are in the faith, that you are following along the course of God. Amen. Paul was dealing with personal issues in his life related to the gospel. But the beautiful thing was that when it was all said and done, he was able to forgive and he had the triumph in Christ. God's people will repeatedly face these types of testings and God is working on our hearts. That's the process of sanctification. I know we talk about that a lot, but that's the process of sanctification. God reveals through trial, through tribulation, things that are in our own hearts. He exposes them. Then he wants to deal with them. He wants to pull them out. Sometimes it's big things. 
You know what I'm saying? Sometimes it's like smoking dope, okay? I'm just saying, you know? Smoking dope, doing all this crazy stuff, and then the Lord starts chipping away at that, and then it's like, oh my goodness, look at me. You're left with who you are. You're left with the stuff that's on the inside of your heart. Personality issues that are completely contrary to the ways of God. You're causing division in the body of Christ. Hello? That's as bad as smoking dope. That's as bad as committing adultery. You're over here caught running your mouth, causing trouble for the kingdom of God. Division, that's a problem. God's not cool with it. And it's things in each and every one of us that God wants to expose so that he can deal with. So that he can do a work in our hearts. Amen. Each and every one of us start with the preacher. God wants to do the work in our hearts. Amen. Amen. Bitterness and a refusal to forgive others is just one example of things that we have to be careful of that the enemy will use against us. We looked at Noah a little. Now, let's look at Israel, which is also God's people. We look at them a lot collectively as the body of Christ as they journey on their journey. Uh, Deuteronomy 29, verses 1 through 6. <laughs> These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab beside the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. So this time frame of Israel's journey is that they're about to enter into the destination that God had planned for them. They've been wandering in a wilderness for 40 years, and now God's ready to bring them in. Amen? He's, Moses calls unto Israel, and he says unto them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt unto Pharaoh. And unto all his servants, and to all his land. And look at this. You saw all this stuff that God did. And you see, you saw the great temptations or the testings. There were all kinds of times in, in their lives that God put them to the test. Which thine eyes have seen. He showed them signs. He allowed manna to fall from heaven. He, 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 he allowed water to come from the rock. He says in those miracles. You saw miracles, all kinds of plagues, and just all these things that God allowed you to see. Yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive, and eyes to see, and ears to hear unto this day. Even though you saw all this stuff, you saw miracles, you saw provision, you saw God show up for you, yet still you can't see, you can't hear, and you don't really understand what God is doing. I'm telling you, that's a story for many Christians. For many of the people of God in the modern era that we live in, even though God has shown up for us, many times we still cannot really hear and see and perceive what it is that the Lord is doing because we're so focused on ourselves. Come on now, it's good. And we're so focused on ourselves. The word is egocentric. Now, I mean, I love this word. I mean, I told y'all when we first started this church, <laughs> haven't said it in a while because I'm trying not to aggravate people, but get a dictionary. Ego, self-centric, centered, self-centered. Every we view the whole world around us like a little two-year-old. Come on, somebody, help me out here. We view the whole world around us like a little two-year-old. It's like we never grew up. And if we don't get our way, we throw our fit. And and it's like, and we don't just don't mind telling people about it. Well, guess what? The world does not revolve completely around you. Are you the apple of God's eye? Absolutely. Will he go to bat for you? Absolutely. Does he want to heal your land? Absolutely. But he's more worried about what he's doing on the big picture. And he's wanting you and I to line up with what he's doing. Amen. And so all these things God has done, yet you still don't see. And he goes on to say this. He says, and I have led you these 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes are not waxing old. In other words, your clothes didn't get messed up. Your shoe hasn't gotten old upon your foot. You have not eaten bread, neither have you drank wine or strong drink, that you might know that I'm the Lord your God. I sent you man from heaven. I caused you to give you water from a rock. Your, your clothes didn't get old. I've told this story before. <laughs> it's kind of funny, but then again, it's maybe not. I was in detention home one time, and it was my birthday while I was in there. And they gave me two presents. One was a thesaurus dictionary and some other book together, which was pretty cool. I held on to that thing for a while and actually used it, even though it was like a high school dropout. And the other one was a sweater. And it was like a, a I don't know, what you call them sweaters you button up? Cardigan. Cardigan. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. You know, I don't know. I had real long hair. I'm like, I don't know how this is. Let's try it out. So I stuck my arm in there. And when I did, 
It's just like like butter. It just all fell apart. Like dust flew in there. It was, the thing was dry rot. Okay, uh, so, but the point was is that I was so embarrassed for them poor people because they had actually tried to do something for me. I hurried up and cr stuff. I didn't make a big deal about it. I didn't want them to know because I felt bad for them, right? But it was kind of an embarrassing situation. But the point is, is this. Why is that? That's just an illustration. That, that garment was waxing old. It got, it got, it rotted. But God took care of the children of Israel. Wouldn't it be nice if all your clothes stayed in style and you never and they never wore out, amen? If you hold on to them long enough, they will stay in style again. But the point is, is this, is that God blessed them. God took care of them for that 40 years, amen? He had delivered his people from Israel. I mean, from, from he had delivered his people Israel from the world, Egypt. He had shown them that he had power over his enemy. His presence was with them every step of the way during their 40 years of testing that they faced. He put tests in their path and he brought deliverance to them when they needed it in so many ways. He took care of them in a financial sense. That's how I look at it. In the sense that their shoes didn't wear out. Their clothes didn't wear out. God will meet your needs. Amen. He will. He's not going to meet your lusts. What I'm saying is when all that stuff that you crave and beyond what it is that he's blessed you with. No, that ain't your needs. That's something that you're coveting. He ain't going to bless that. As a matter of fact, he's going to teach you. Amen. He's going to teach you. Or you can just keep on rolling. <laughs> and then it ends up being a big old mess in the end. I learned that the hard way too. Yet they still couldn't see. They couldn't perceive what God was doing. And there's so many times that God does work in the lives of these people, work where he proves himself time and again, yet for whatever reason, they still don't see, hear, or perceive. And many times it's because they don't really want to. Because if we start perceiving what God's really saying, we might realize that we have to let go of things that he's wanting us to let go of. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verses 7 through 9. And when we came unto this place, Sihon, the king of Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us unto battle, and we smote them, and we took their land and gave it for an inheritance unto the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Keep, therefore, the words of this covenant and do them that you may prosper in all that you do. So he's talking about right there, before we actually entered into the, before we entered into the promised land or before we're going to enter into the promised land, already God has shown up before we even get over there. Because there was, there was a couple of these tribes that didn't want to enter in. They, hey, like, hey, man, this land is good for us right here. We'll, we'll be happy to settle right here. But the problem was there was a giant in the land. Specifically one right there. You don't have to go there. But Deuteronomy chapter 3 verse 11. Og of Bashan says his bed. I, I kind of, y'all laugh at me. Y'all been seeing me like last night. I was over here trying to balance myself to see how big it was. But so his bed was nine cubits long. So that's about 1.5 feet because a cubit is about the length of a man's fingertips to his elbow, which is about 16 inches. So 1.5 times nine is 13.5. His bed was from about the end of this pulpit to right here. That's a big old boy, man. And you know, but God gave them victory over the king Og of Bashan and that they settled in his land and the point spiritually that I want to make about that is, is that he gives victory. Amen. God gives victory. And many times the issues that are in our life are like the giants that were in the land. They're real big and they're strongholds, meaning Agabashan had been there for a while and he wasn't going to give up. And his people had been there for a while and he wasn't planning on giving up that land to anybody. And many times there's things that are in our lives that are so rooted, so deep. And the enemy don't want to let go. He's not going to give up easy. And it's real big. And it looks almost impossible to defeat. But with the power of God, God will show up for his people. And he will give victory in those circumstances and those situations. Amen. You, you can just filter it in your own mind and fill in your own blanks of what your, your giants are in your own life. Let's look at Deuteronomy 29 verses 10 through 13. You stand this day before the Lord your God, your captains, that's leaders, or bosses, that's how I would look at it today, bosses or leaders, of your tribes, your elders, your officers, with all the men of Israel, your little ones, your children, your wives, your spouses, and the strangers. You know, there were strangers, people from other nations that saw the light of Israel that wanted to be one of them and would convert over to their religion. 
And so they were not natural born Israelites, but yet they were now serving their God and living with them. These are the people that you come into contact to get saved. He says that is in your camp. Also, from the hewer of wood, somebody that chops wood, servants, unto the drawer of water, another type of servant, that you should enter into covenant with the Lord your God and enter and into his oath, which the Lord your God makes with you this day, that he may establish you to, to, today for a people unto himself, and that he may be unto thee a God, as he has said unto you, and as he swore unto your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Now, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is a term that has long history behind it. You understand what I'm saying? When you hear that terminology, you should hear, you should think of the longevity of God. Your little life is short. You're but a vapor. But you should be reminded of the fact that God has been here for a long time. And he's been working his plan for a long time. He says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And even 500 years later, I am the God of you. And on this day, you need to make a public account that you're going to serve me. Your captains. I call it, if we want to bring it over into modern time, vernacular, your bosses. Whether you're a boss in the church or you're a servant, a worker in the church. You've got to stand up and make an account. With your children, your spouses, people that you've witnessed to. Whoever you're going to live your life before, you're going to make a public declaration before the Lord in front of all of these people that you're going to live for the Lord. It doesn't matter whether you own a company or whether you pick up the garbage. If you're going to say that you're the child of God, we're all level in the eyes of God. Economically, that none of that stuff matters. It might have changed some things on this earth, but in God's mind, He is no respecter of person. Amen. It don't matter what you kind of clothes you come up in here wearing. Jesus spilled it, not spilled. That's an accident. Jesus uh, shed enough blood, the same amount of blood as He did for the person who doesn't have fine clothing, as He did for the person that wears a robe. Right. None of that means anything to the Lord. Amen. But if you're going to live for the Lord, you're going to stand up and you're going to make a public declaration, and people are watching. Your family's watching. The people you're around are watching. Your children are watching. And he wants a separated people. And we're about to get into that. He wants a separated people. Are you going to live for me or are you going to live for the world? That's what he wants to know. Deuteronomy 29 verses 16 through 18. He goes on to say, For you know how we have dwelt in the land of Egypt. You used to live in the world. You used to live in Egypt. You used to live in the world. And how we came through the nations which you passed by. Even once you got saved, you still existed in this world, right? You're not of the world, but you're in the world. Even once you're born again. So we're looking at Israel and they're journeying on their journey. And they're walking through this wilderness experience, this 40 years. Noah, 40 days. Israel, 40 years. A trial in their life. And he says, you came through these nations which you passed by and you have seen their abominations. Their idols, their wood, their stone, their silver and gold, which were among them. Lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turns away this day from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations. Lest there should be among you a root that bears gall and wormwood. Both gall and wormwood were poisonous plants. The idea was is that I brought you out of the world, but as you've been on this journey in the world, you're supposed to make a public declaration. You're saying you want to serve me. You're saying you want me to be your God and you want me to be your children. But as you're walking through this world, there's all kinds of wormwood. There's all kinds of gall. There's all kinds of poison that wants to cause a root to enter into the midst of your heart. Things from the world that want to enter into the midst of your heart to cause you to live more in the world than you're going to live for me. And the question that he's asking is, who are you going to serve? Are you going to separate yourself and live for me? Or are you going to live in the world? Are you going to be lukewarm? Are you going to mix it up a little bit and get you a little bit of world? Get you some church time too? This is really what their 40-year trial was all about. God had brought them out of the world of Egypt and he was with them every step of the way. But even in their journey, they encountered the world on a regular basis. While it wasn't Egypt, it might have been Moab or the Ammonites or someone else. But the point that God was making is that they had seen as they walked with him the difference 
between the world's ways and his ways. That's, That's right. my question. Right. Just one real question for everyone here this morning. Have you seen the difference? Can you see the difference? Has Maybe the first question is, has God done things in your life like he did in Israel's life? But yet at the same time, can we hear? Can we see? Can we perceive? Can we see the difference between the world and the kingdom of God? Oh, I don't like, I don't like when you talk like that, preacher. He's challenging me now. Well, I'm not challenging nothing. I'm reading the word of God, and the word of God challenges us. And it shows us and it delineates the difference between the world and the church. Amen? I was having a conversation with somebody the other day. And we're talking about the difference between whether you bring your kid to a public school, whether your kids are homeschooled, whether your kids go to a Christian school. And one of the things that I've known is it's not a not right answer in any of that. I've seen some people that are homeschooled that are the best dog old kids that you ever want to see. I've some, seen some kids that were homeschooled that, I'm sorry, their parents were so unorganized that they, they never, they did not accomplish the things that they could have accomplished. And it wasn't really the way that it should have been. And then at the same time, I've seen some kids that go to Christian school that they don't serve the Lord the way that I would have expected them to. But I've seen some kids in public school that are on fire for Jesus and they love the Lord and they live a separated life. So you know what? You got to figure out between you and the Lord what's best for your kids. Is. Point being is that's the same story here. We are navigating this journey and God is wanting to know, are we going to live for him or are we going to live in the world? This brings me to the last passage that we're going to cover because the salvation that Noah received and then the 40 days he faced and the salvation that Israel received and the 40 years they faced are similar spiritually to the salvation we received and the testings we will face. First Peter Chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fades not away and is reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith, unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Boy, there's some good stuff right there. You know, the truth of the matter is, is this, is that the scripture talks about the fact that, um, that God has given birth to. That's what the word begotten means right there. God has given birth to a people. Amen. God has given birth to a people and that because of this new birth, that there's an inheritance, an incorruptible inheritance that's reserved in heaven and, and, and it's waiting for us. And that word reserved right there has the idea behind it of that it's being kept guarded and that it, through the through keeping the eyes on God has keeping it. God is keeping his eyes on the inheritance that is undefiled and is waiting for you. It's an eternal inheritance. But it's not coming to the end day of your salvation. I don't know if that gets you excited or not, but to know that, see, that's the difference between the world and the church. The world and what the devil promises, what he promised Eve, you get what you got coming to you now. And so the world lives for today. And all of the stuff that they do is living for today. The Christian's promises are delayed the ultimate fulfillment of until he reaches glory. Until the final process of his salvation is complete. But there's an inheritance that's waiting for you then. That's why you're going to go through things on this earth. And it's not always going to go the way that you want it to. But you need to hold on to the promise that God has for you. Because he's keeping his eye on it for you. Let's look at verses <clears throat> 6 through 9 real quick. He says, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season if need be. You are in heaviness through manifold temp temptations that the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold. I mean, gold is precious, but it's temporary. See, but the trial of your faith is something that's eternal. If that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found in the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, <clears throat> whom having not seen, you love. You had never seen him with your physical eyes, but you sure do love him. You wouldn't really be coming to church if you didn't love him at all. In whom, though now you see him not, 
Yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. In other words, even though you can't see Jesus, you're holding on to him and you're filled with the joy, amen, of the Lord because you're longing for and waiting for as you travel through the journey. Even though many times you're under heaviness and because of the temptations and the trials that you face, there's a joy that's still on the inside of you because that word heaviness describes a heavy burden or sorrow or grief that's placed upon you that you encounter. Even in the midst of all of that, the joy of the Lord is still with you. You're going to find yourself in those circumstances and situations, yet the joy of the Lord is still with you because the Lord is desiring to bring you through to the other side because you understand that the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, is going to connect, connect you to Him and something eternal and that there's an inheritance waiting for you. All this is part of the testing of the faith until we come to the end of the faith, which is the final salvation of our souls. I like this part here in verses 10 through 12. It says, of which salvation. So it's talking about your salvation. And so now the apostle is talking about, he's connecting it. This salvation, the prophets inquired and searched diligently. So in other words, the Old Testament prophets, they studied the scriptures that they had. And they, start, and, they, and they prophesied for God as the Holy Spirit moved on them that spoke more about the day when Messiah would come. And so they diligently searched and they diligently did the will of God and they spoke for God. They were his mouthpiece. But look what he says. Who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. So all of the work that the prophets did in the Old Testament spoke forth to the day that you and I were born in called the church age. And it was all for us that we would have a greater understanding and a revelation. They didn't even understand it. But God was using them as mouthpieces to prepare the people in advance that Jesus was coming. He says, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ. Multiple prophets talked about the sufferings of Jesus. Let us know in advance that it would happen and the glory that should follow the glory that came after the sacrifice of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, how he descended on the church, the Holy Spirit, how he lives inside of people's lives and strengthens them. Amen. And encourages them. Look at this. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Look at this part. Which things the angels desire to look into. I love that scripture. I know I've preached that scripture a lot since we started the church, really, if you remember. The, you know, But that word angels look into, it has the idea of, if this little ledge was the edge of heaven, they're peering over. It's like they're looking at this thing called grace that's played out on the playing field of humanity. They're peering into, they don't understand grace. You understand that? Like, I mean, they might understand it intellectually, but they've never experienced it. Why? Because you're either a fallen angel or you're an angel of God. The fallen angels don't get grace. They can't be saved. <laughs> And the angels that are with God just know that they used to have some partners that used to be with them that are there no longer. But yet they see humanity on the, on the earth and they see humanity struggling. They see humanity falling. They see humanity getting back up. They see you in your worst of times. They see you in the midst of your heaviness and temptations and trials. They see you when sometimes the enemy whispers in your ear so much so that he, he's trying to convince you to quit. Now I can only imagine them up there screaming, hey! Quit down there. I can see your inheritance. It's right here. Amen. You're really going to like it. God's got his eye on it. He's protecting it for you. Don't quit. Don't buy the lies of the devil. You had the, the, the Old Testament prophets foretold this day that you're now living in where grace would move in your life and strengthen you. God promised that he'd be with you. He was with Noah in the ark. He was with the children of Israel in those 40 years. And he's going to be with you in Christ as you travel this journey called Christianity. God gives grace. Amen. Last, last. Verses right here, verses 13 through 16. He says, wherefore, because of that, because God used the Old Testament prophets to tell you about something that was going to come because the angels peer over and look at all of this. Wherefore, gird up your loins. Gird up yourself. And what does it mean? It means get ready. 
Get ready for the journey. You know, back in them days, they used to wear these long, like, kind of like robe things. And, they, and I told you all about this before, but when you girded up your loins, you'd pull the back of your robe through, and you'd tuck it through your belt, and you'd pull it up through your belt. Why? Because if you were going on a journey and you needed to get to moving, you can't run with stuff flopping all around. So you'd gird up your loins. You'd pull that thing up through there. It meant you were getting ready. So Paul Peter said, now that you know all this stuff, yeah, you're going through some trials. You're going through some bad times. This is temporary. You got an eternal inheritance waiting for you. God has gone through all this. So gird up your loins and get ready for the journey. The loins of your mind. Be sober. And hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, look, man, when Jesus shows up, all this stuff is changed. Amen. All this journey, it'll be have been worth it. Every tear that was shed, every pain that was felt, every trial, every struggle, everything that you went through will have all been worth it. Because when the Lord shows up, your salvation will be complete. You receive your glorified body and you get to operate in the inheritance that God truly has for you. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. It's almost like he's saying, look, as you're traveling and you're girding up your loins and you're, you're preparing your mind and you're being sober and you're walking through this, this earth, don't fashion yourselves according to your former way of life. It's kind of like he told the children of Israel, as you're walking through these other nations, don't let that gall and that, and that, and that, and that, and that wormwood and that poison from the world get up on the inside of you and cause you cause that poison to infect you. Don't, don't let that happen. In, in closing, let's go to 1 Timothy 6.12. The Apostle Paul, Paul told young Timothy, he said, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto you are also called, and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. Fight the good fight of faith. Once again, there's going to be things in this life that are going to try to draw you away from fighting the good fight of faith. Young Timothy, you made a profession before many witnesses. You confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you did it publicly like God asked the children of Israel to do. And now you're on this journey. you got to keep fighting the good fight of faith. It doesn't matter who comes against you. It doesn't matter what you experience. It doesn't matter how heavy the trial is. you got to keep fighting the good fight of faith. It's faith in Christ, amen, that saved you. It's continued faith in Christ that allows you to have the grace that you need from the Holy Spirit to strengthen you. The enemy wants to get you off that faith. He wants to pull you away from looking to the Lord's Christ and instead for you to start looking towards your problem, your situation, your trial, your temptation. And if you allow the enemy to have his way in that area, whatever it is, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to pull you out the fight for a period of time.